Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Taves, and I am the chair of IPAC Manitoba. And we are very excited to bring to you today um, series, or I guess episode two of um, IPAC's uh, emergency management series. Today we have Robert Monroe um, joining us. He's the manager of education and quality assurance with Manitoba's Emergency Measures Organization. Um, and we're very happy to have him here today um, to go over a presentation and to be able to take some questions. So before I get started, I just want to do um, a quick land acknowledgement. So IPAC Manitoba is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Aninawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Den and Dene, and on the homeland uh, of the Métis. We acknowledge the distinct histories of the seven number treaties that apply on this land. We recognize that public administration and public policy have been used as tools of colonialism and the harms that this has caused to Indigenous people. We are committed to promoting public administration in a way that advances reconciliation in a spirit of collaboration with Indigenous peoples and communities. So um, just quickly before uh, we get started, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with IPAC, IPAC Manitoba is a recognized leader in research, training, knowledge sharing and outreach, including hosting a number of conferences and events that are held regionally and nationally. Our membership-based organization works with all levels of government to promote quality public services and practices. And we're known for our role in engaging with experienced public service to expand their networks and advance ex excellent excellence in every public sector organization in Manitoba. Um, and so we are uh, the Manitoba group that's a part of a more of a national network. So I know that there's probably a few of you that might be joining us from out of province. So welcome. Um, it's uh, nice to see new names, new faces. Um, just uh, one little bit of housekeeping. Um, I will hand it over to Robert shortly. Um, but uh, in terms of asking questions, if you have questions throughout the presentation, um, there is a Q&A box um, at the bottom of the screen. So I'll ask that any questions get put in there, we'll be able to um, type out the answers live as they're being um, answered. So with that, I'll move into just a quick introduction of Robert. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, Robert is the manager of education and quality assurance at Manitoba's Emergency Measures Organization. Uh, Robert has attained a master's degree in disaster and emergency management from Royal Roads University. He has more than 39 years of experience in the field of disaster and emergency management, which began through uh, the lens as a paramedic across Manitoba, leading up to an emergency medical services manager and finally a disaster specialist. Robert has managed provincial level emergencies, including flood, fires, tornadoes, health facility evacuations, First Nation community evacuations, and two pandemics. His current portfolio includes managing all education, training, and exercises management of quality assurance, mass evacuation, sheltering and reentry, provincial hazard risk, and vulnerability analysis. Robert is a sessional speaker for the University of Manitoba and Red River College Polytech, and uh, an international speaker presenting uh, disaster management topics across North America, Asia, and Iceland. So um, with that, welcome, and I'll hand it off to Robert. Well, thank you very much for that. And I'll just verify that you are able to see my screen. Not yet. How about now? Um, I still can't see. Technical difficulty. We did test this, ladies and gentlemen. It was working just moments ago, and now, uh, now it's not. So, uh, my apologies. How about now? 
I, oh, no, I don't see anything. My screen had flashed there for a second, but um, I can, I'll go ahead and try to share mine. Let's see. Sure, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I see some thumbs up. So I think that means that uh, we can see that now. Everyone, okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that, Stephanie. I appreciate that. All right, uh, so good morning, good lunchtime and good afternoon to all of you from uh, all across Canada. Uh, on behalf of the Manitoba Emergency Measures Organization, thank you for the opportunity to be able to present uh, to you our behind the scenes look at um, emergency management in the province of Manitoba. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Stephanie. And I don't know if you want to put it full screen or I'm, I'm okay. I don't need the notes. So. If you go bottom left by the zoom or bottom right, sorry, by the zoom, that little projection one, that'll, that'll make it full screen. Okay. Well, that's being done. Uh, so Manitoba, um, Emergency Measure Organization is governed by the Manitoba Emergency Measures Act. And this act clearly outlines two foundational mandates. The first one is overseeing and coordinating all aspects of emergency preparedness in the province of Manitoba. And the second one is managing, directing, and coordinating the response of all departments to a major emergency or disaster. So that is the response component to it. So uh, primarily preparedness and response is what we're all about. Um, Manitoba is an evolving entity that looks at to enhance Manitoba's capacity to mitigate against, prepare for, respond to, and recover from all emergencies and disasters that happen within the province, and some that happen outside the province and even outside the country of Canada. Uh, we continue to deliver clear and concise programming that utilizes both current and innovative processes, and we're always looking to enhance and, and engage. So I'm very, I'm very excited to be able to network out further with this group because maybe there's some ideas that you can share with us that would better, uh, better enable us to provide our services. Uh, all right, we're going to go to the next slide, please, which is the mission, vision, sorry, vision, mission, values. So our vision for Manitoba is a safe Manitoba that is resilient to all hazards, emergencies, and disasters. Um, our mission is to work continuously with all partners by coordinating and integrating activities to mitigate against, prepare for, respond to, and recover from all emergencies and disasters. Stephanie, if you want to go to the next slide, please. All right. Uh, you might ask who our partners are. And so our partners are uh, 137 local authorities within the province of Manitoba, also known as municipalities. We have 48 Indigenous Reconciliation and Northern Relation communities. We have 20 provincial government departments and at least six federal organizations, all of which we meet with on almost a weekly basis in the province of Manitoba. And that includes the 63 First Nations that also exist in the province of Manitoba. All right. Are you able to go to the next slide, Stephanie? Yeah, it's not advancing on, on our end. All right, uh, so with that, oh, we'll come back to this. Sorry, just give me one second here. Let me, let me try one more thing on my end, just to see if we can, if we can get this to go. How about now? Can you see my screen? We can, yes. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the thumbs up. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to try and uh, get this puppy to go from the beginning, and I'll just advance a couple slides. All right, so here we are on the mission, vision, values. So, um, Manitoba will work continuously with partners by coordinating. So now you know who all of our all of our partners are to coordinate and integrate activities to mitigate against. You're going to hear this multiple times through the presentation. Mitigate against, prepare for, respond to, and recover from all emergencies and disasters. And we have four key values in which uh, we will be uh, adopt. Now, in relation to the guiding principles, um, Manitoba, sorry, I just have to move something out of the way. Uh, 
Today's emergency management vision includes a whole of society model, which promotes engagement between all sectors in coordination with various levels of government. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I'm advancing so fast here. Um, we have an all hazards approach to emergency planning in Manitoba that requires communities themselves to identify and assess risks and use measures of performance for plans and resources to help and a decision-making process. So all hazards preparation does not and cannot mean that emergency management personnel plan for every possible event that could occur in the province of Manitoba, but it does focus on the hazards that are most likely to impact those communities while remaining adaptable to effectively respond to um, the unexpected. So these seven principles you see on this on the slide will uh, will guide us on this journey. So we want to ensure we have a comprehensive emergency management plan, that it is risk based, that we are collaborative and not doing this on our own. We're actually working with all of the partners that we just mentioned. And that that changes significantly when we're trying to ensure that we've done things at a provincial level, at a regional level and at a, at a municipal level or local authority level. Quality assurance is, of course, a key component to the, to the work we do. We want to ensure that we're always going through a continuous quality improvement process and adapting as, as things change, because things are constantly changing in Manitoba. Uh, adaptability is the next one. Professional, of course, we always want to ensure that we're providing the best evidence approach, uh, approach methods towards education, uh, training, and public stewardship. And then, of course, service excellence. We want to ensure that emergency management strives to deliver the services to our clients. All right, now in this structure that you see before you, um, it is the entire representation of emergency management division. There are actually two branches that exist within the division. We're gonna be discussing the preparedness and response branch in this presentation. We have uh, restructured our branch to better support preparedness and response activities. And as a result, sorry, as a result, um, of the restructuring, three distinct business units have been developed to create efficiency gains and address gaps in our previous service model. So we're gonna be looking at the folks on the left-hand side of the screen, as opposed to the, the folks on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, so the three units that I just referred to are um, the business development unit, the education and quality assurance unit, and the support services unit. So the business development unit was created to enhance the initiatives of the preparedness and response branch, and it has evolved into developing and maintaining policies and overarching frameworks for, for branch. My apologies, somehow this is advancing without my knowledge. There we go. Um, or branch uh, frameworks. We're also the lead on training and education, ensuring uh, we have engagement with all government departments and municipalities. We lead and maintain a comprehensive provincial business continuity program within the province of Manitoba, and we align our strategies with overarching legislation, regulations, and long-term priorities. Now, the Education Quality Assurance and Service Excellent Unit uh, ensures that we develop service standards, templates, and schedules to establish the parameters of what the standards are going to be. And finally, the Service Support Unit, or sorry, Support Services Unit, my apologies, uh, is ensuring that we uh, are responsible to provide both advisory and broadcast immediate emergency alerts through radio, television, and compatible wireless devices when requested and required traditionally by the RCMP or Environment and Climate Change Canada. We're also responsible to advise and support local authorities with the development of emergency management plans and programs and the implementation of those plans during an emergency. All right, I'm finally advancing the slide myself. So similar to public administration, you have four pillars of economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. Manitoba EMO follows the four foundational pillars or phases that we call them of emergency management. So I thought I should provide you with some Manitoba examples of what these words mean to us. So the first one being mitigation. And uh, basically which defines as actions taken to reduce the impacts for a disaster event. And the best example I can give you for the province of Manitoba is we have the Red River Floodway. And the Red River Floodway basically surrounds the southern portion of the city of Winnipeg. And it diverts millions, millions upon millions of liters of water around the capital every year that it floods. And we can't stop the flooding from occurring, but we can mitigate it. So that, there's the best example I have for that. 
from a preparedness perspective, activities to prepare for and respond to an emergency and manage its consequences prior to an event. So that's all about preparedness. So the best examples are to write an emergency plan, which I'm sure all of you have a personal emergency plan and you know what to do in the event of an emergency that would occur in your home or in your neighborhood or in your community. And then we also conduct emergency management exercises and training. And this is kind of the highlight. It's the cherry on top for whenever we roll out and do an exercise, the comment we get back most often is we have to do that again. It was so exciting. It was so interesting. It was so engaging. We got to do this more often so that we are better prepared. So that's the preparedness piece. The response piece are the actions taken during an emergency event. Now, this is the lights and sirens stuff. This is the stuff most people see on television. It's what the media covers most of the time. Um, you would be familiar with that. One of the highlights of what we do in the province of Manitoba or what Emergency Measures Organization does is the emergency alerting and evacuations. So in Manitoba, every year, we evacuate more than 2,000 people every year. So we, we, we've, we've gotten pretty well practiced at that. And then finally, recovery. And these are the actions to repair to or restore to an acceptable level following an event. And so that could ensure that roads are open because with the flooding that occurs, we do close hundreds of roads every year. Uh, communications are restored. So working with our telecommunications companies, uh, power companies as well, Manitoba Hydro, uh, and any educated, sorry, any evacuated individuals that have uh, need to be returned to their communities. So that's the, the four pillars or the four foundational phases of emergency management in Manitoba. So the next slide is all about our priorities. So we have two main priorities. Our priorities are to continue to offer and enhance our support levels for all partners and clients. We want to make sure that they are all aware of the initiatives and services that we have available. And we also want to, our service delivery model to be clear. We actually just completed our municipal work workshops throughout the province of Manitoba, where all 137 municipalities were invited to attend. And uh, we provided new tools to enhance our preparedness and response activities. And these, these were very well received and, and we're uh, very happy that they are done. That was, uh, that was last week. Next week, we're gonna be working on a new set of uh, sessions where we're gonna be working again with all the municipalities that would be or could be impacted by a flood in the province of Manitoba with our spring flood seminars. So I thought this slide might be of particular interest to this audience, so the IPAC audience, as it outlines the what of an emergency management program. And there are six key components listed. There's program leadership and guidance, there's partnership building, there is the analysis, the program planning, emergency planning, and administration. So what, what we want to ensure that we have is we have um, within each municipality, we have something called a local emergency response control group. And that's a group that's, it's more of a committee. It's a committee that's designed to, to oversee the emergency management program within that municipality or every municipality. We, we also require that there is a municipal emergency coordinator that does the hands-on planning for events as before they arise. And there's also community advisory committees. Depending on the size of the municipality, they may have both or they may only have one of those two. Uh, partnership building, of course, is really important. And so within municipalities, if they can work together, if there are neighboring communities that have the ability to share some equipment or resources, uh, that's always a good way to go. And to hold regional coordination meetings to ensure that everyone is familiar with whatever the hazards are and, and that we work with them. Now, I just mentioned hazards, and that's the analysis part. And that's really important because the analysis or the hazards part basically ensure that we know or, or we're gonna create a roadmap of what we really need to work on. And every municipality is different. So it's not just a carte blanche, paint everyone with the same blush, brush and you know what to do. In this instance, what we do is we actually break down the 69 known hazards in the province of Manitoba. I'll say that weather balloons are not something that was on our list last week, but it's now on our list now uh, to ensure that we are better prepared. So what are those hazards that we need to prepare for? And what has the community done to ensure that they are already prepared for things? So in some instances, there already is police, fire, and EMS in communities. So those basics have been covered. But what, what happens when we need to do an evacuation of a community due to a, a forest fire or excessive smoke or flooding or a plane crash and those kind of things? We have those listed and every municipality then provides us with the information of what they believe their top hazards are and then what they're doing to work towards ensuring that they're taken care of. Uh, program planning, of course, is really important. That's back to the public education information program, um, mitigation, 
Uh, emergency social services is what ESS stands for there. And emergency social services basically looks after the human aspects of things. So if people were evacuated, we want to ensure they have basic the coverage of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you want to make sure there's food, shelter, clothing. The one thing that Maslow didn't have uh, when he was writing this, you know, more than 100 years ago, was Wi-Fi. And that's a, that's a new thing that we're, we're discovering that we need to ensure people have, because that's the way this world now connects with everyone else. And we need to ensure that we have those, those things in place. Uh, so of course, emergency planning, we need to make sure we have plans in place. So there's an emergency management program. And within the program, you have a plan. Here's what you need to do, but from an all hazards perspective. So again, we don't need to write a plan for everything, but we need to ensure that there's a general plan. So if we needed to do an evacuation, it doesn't matter if it's from a wildfire or a flood or a plane crash, we know how we would move people to another safer location. And then finally, of course, is the administration. The whole purpose of me being here today with IPAC is to ensure that emergency management spending authorities and budgets are already allocated. And what you would do in the event that there is no allocation for those funds, what are the steps you would need to, to follow through on? What is the incident uh, finance administration protocol? We, we can't just assume that, oh, something happens, somebody's just gonna write a check. We need to know what those protocols are and who or what organizations we need to work with to ensure that we can get those uh, appropriate resources or equipment. And then finally scheduling. <laughs> I can't understate this enough. Um, sorry, can't overstate this enough. It's really imperative that we don't burn people out when managing an emergency. So whether this is true for your organization or whether it's true with your organization managing, managing an emergency, you always want to ensure that you're, you're, you're not running your people 24 seven for, for 30 days because that's how long the event lasted because at the end of that, everybody's gonna need time off and there's no way to recoup that time typically in a year. And it's really hard to continue your activities of business continuity, uh, ensuring that the regular day-to-day -day work still gets done. Okay, so now we're into program requirements. So during an emergency uh, response, EMO's regional emergency managers or REMS are able to provide assistance and guidance support expertise related to response efforts. The regional emergency manager works with authorities to stand up, as an example, to stand up an emergency operation center. Um, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with that term, emergency operation center or, or emergency coordination center basically is the, is the room, whether it's a physical location or these days we've learned with COVID, we can do a lot more things virtually. So we may set up a virtual emergency operation center where everyone calls in through a, a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting where we can get the information that we need to share appropriately, have those meetings, and then go back to our day-to-day, -day, send the emails, talk to people on the phone, go out, do the sandbagging, put out the fire, whatever we need to do, and then meet back again so that we have a coordinated approach in doing so. In addition, they may determine or assist the municipality in determining when they need to declare a state of local emergency. And so a state of local emergency is, is a very important process when managing an emergency. And in some cases, whatever the event is, exceeds the resources that are available to that municipality. So what the municipality does is they put together a, a council meeting and they pass a resolution indicating that they are declaring a state of emergency. This falls in alignment to the Manitoba Emergency Measures Act. And within the act, there are 12 uh, civil liberties that could be uh, impacted or changed to allow the emergency to be appropriately managed by the municipality and or by the province of Manitoba. Uh, another thing could be that uh, how to how to actually cancel a state of local emergency where we've gone through the emergency we don't have to have that declaration anymore and we need to uh, we need to put things back to normal and evacuations this is another really big thing that these REMs have a lot of experience with that I've already indicated where they pardon me, they know about the transportation, they know about the accommodations, they know about the food, they know about those processes and they can guide the municipality working with emergency social services. Um, so I should very clearly state here that we have a, a number of partner organizations we work with. We don't do all of this ourselves. We're the coordinator and manager of an event or of a response, uh, but certainly there are a lot of uh, groups that we work with and we greatly appreciate all the efforts. In addition, they may implement or activate the, the Manitoba Municipal Emergency Plan, which could be business continuity planning. So just because an event occurs doesn't mean that you get to close up shop and say, well, our municipality is busy dealing with this. There are still other things that have to happen in, in your community. 
such as evacuations or recovery from events or, or things like that. So within a program itself, there are those um, five items that are listed. There's the municipal emergency plans, the municipal emergency operations center, the state of local emergency, the mutual aid programs and evacuation that I've mentioned. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into the services that Manitoba EMO offers um, basically 24 seven should be required uh, through our uh, preparedness and response branch. And so they are as listed there, but I'm gonna go through each one of these on the, the uh, adjoining slides. So we will go uh, step-by-step step through them. So the very first one is the emergency alerting program. Now this is a national program. However, for within each province, uh, we, are, we are the designated organizer or holder of this responsibility to ensure that when alerts need to go out, that they do so through a very, very rigorous uh, process. And so, um, so a lot of you, hopefully, if you had a phone and uh, you have lived in the province of Manitoba, you will have seen uh, and heard one of these emergency alerts happen. They, they are rare. We want them to be rare because we really only want them to occur during an actual emergency in the province of Manitoba. So what we do is we provide oversight and management of emergency alerting, uh, including training, auditing, and certification for all authorized alert issuers in the province of Manitoba. We have a maintenance policy, of course, maintaining all of those. We provide public education and awareness for what emergency alerting is, and we do that in conjunction with the national body. We work with partners at all levels, including federal, provincial, territorial, and broadcasters and wireless service providers to ensure they are prepared for the wireless alerting system. And we do that at a national level as well. So the next, so that that's all about emergency alerting process for the province of Manitoba. The next service we provide is a 24 seven duty officer program. So if something does occur within the province of Manitoba, we have a 24 seven system that alerts us to what's going on. And the, do we have, we have dedicated duty officers that have a significant amount of training to be able to manage any of these events that occur. So the duty officer is, um, required to review, analyze the data information, maintain situational awareness, then distribute that emergency information to our stakeholders, partners, and clients, and facilitate the coordination of a major emergency or disaster. We provide the following uh, activities. We provide situational updates, reports, and notifications to all of our stakeholders. We coordinate the emergency response of provincial government by chairing teleconferences and operating the Manitoba Emergency Coordination Center. I'm actually in the office today and in the office, we actually have almost half of a floor dedicated with multiple computers, multiple stations, phones, everything we would need to coordinate everything from one central hub. And in that building or in, in that room, we actually have seats for all of our stakeholders and partners all of the people that would be engaged, all of the government departments, all of the non-government organizations, all of the federal organizations um, to ensure that there's a place where we can all get together in one room and we can work through whatever the emergency event is and for extended periods of time. So days into weeks into months. Uh, we are the point of contact for requesting uh, assistance or requesting uh, assistance agreements for neighboring jurisdictions. So it could be other provinces. And we are the point of contact for emergency social services that we spoke to earlier. Okay. Um, in relation to uh, the Emergency Coordination Center, I've actually just given that away. So here's an example of, of what it is. We have some of our staff actually um, in the Emergency Coordination Center. So we're, we're looking at things, we're answering the phones, we're, we're referring to maps, or we actually have, we have to have, we have new technology now, so it's not all just maps. But but it's always good to just have something to look at, to just get an idea of what the areas we're talking about in a group setting, and then we can work on things uh, more from a GIS perspective as well. Um, if we're activated, we have the centralized coordination of the province responding to any emergency or event that happens within the province. Okay, and so that's our MEC or Manitoba Emergency Coordination Center. Next is our emergency management portal. Now this is a new technology that we've created in-house in the province of Manitoba, uh, and it's used to coordinate and collaborate with all stakeholders, partners, and clients. So this is a web-based system where we share information. So we've got a, a screenshot here, of course, of what we had used it for last year, which was the wildfire of 2022 and the flood of 2022, and how all of our partners and stakeholders can actually come together in this one 
virtual event because it's cloud-based. So you don't have to be physically in the building at 405 Broadway in Winnipeg, Manitoba. You could be wherever you need to be in the province of Manitoba managing this event, but still get the information with the most latest up-to-date information regarding the event that's occurring. Okay, so key objectives of the Emergency Management Portal are ease of usability, providing timely and accurate information regarding emergency situations, enabling rapid responses of uh, emergencies while fostering increased confidence levels at stakeholder level and information being disseminated. So we're validating all the information we get by more than one source to ensure that we're providing the most up-to-date and realistic information so that planning can occur or response can occur to ensure that we're doing the best for Manitobans. And we act as a centralized repository, providing a focal point for maintaining key information leading to consistent messaging. So ensuring that if something is said, we actually have that, hold that in our library, and then we can share that at, in future events or everyone has access to it at this time of the event occurring. All right, so that's our portal. We do have uh, online our emergency services guide. So basically anything that anyone needs from a municipal or, or provincial standards perspective, everything is, is accessed or we have the service catalog that is accessible to everyone in the province of Manitoba that has access to this, um, which, which then provides our services as I'm describing them to you. Uh, the next one we have up here is our emergency management training program. So it is an essential part of our, our uh, emergency management program, and we provide training programs throughout exercise design and presentations on various emergency management courses. We actually have five courses up on our website right now that anyone can use on a um, at, at your leisure whenever you have the time to be able to sit down and, and take the courses and their foundational emergency management programs so that you'll have a better understanding of, of what it is that I'm rambling about for everyone. Uh, they're all available and they're all free of charge. All you have to do is set up an account on the, the website and you are good to go. All right. Uh, EMO services continues with exercise design programs. So as I said earlier, it's one of the things that everybody likes to do because it's kind of interactive, it's hands-on. So there are actually six different levels of exercises that people can participate in. The first one is just a seminar, similar to what we're doing today, just giving you the, the groundwork of what emergency management is all about. And then the next would be drills, very similar to what we talk about when we say there's a fire drill in your building. That's what a drill is. It's just to make the memories of needing to do what steps in order to to create a safe environment. The next would be a tabletop, and that gets into a better understanding of what things um, what things can be exercised. And in essence, what we really wanna do is we wanna take your emergency plan, and then we wanna actually run it through its paces. So throw some what we call injects or some ideas of things that could happen and walk you through at sitting at a table with everyone involved, what would happen from A to B to C to D all the way to Z. And then once that's done, then we would take that same exercise that same plan that you develop and we turn it into a functional exercise where we're going to be uh, activating some key components of that to make sure that we know that everyone is comfortable and familiar with that and then the final type of exercise would be that of a full scale where that's where you see uh, on the media lots of times where you know you have um, a, it's a simulation in event which you're going to have police fire ems uh, border services um, it could be the airport, it, it could be any number of entities that we partner with on a regular basis, we want to run a test through, and it provides us with identifying the gaps. And that's really the key component of an exercise design program, is just identifying the gaps that we, we didn't actually consider in our emergency management plan, and we want to make sure that we're better um, the next time. Okay, quality assurance is a program responsible for the development and maintenance of services, standards, templates, and schedules. And we look at all emergency management programs to ensure that they are following a similar and continuous improvement process. All right, uh, we have much more on that one. So we're gonna go next to business continuity. Now, a lot of people may be confused or not really fully understand the, the importance of a business continuity program. So in the province of Manitoba, we can have an event that's occurring and that takes up all of our time, all of our resources, and let's say it's the flood of 2022. So it's really important we're, we're active and we're responding to that, but we can't just say, oh, well, because we're having a flood, we can't do anything else. We need to ensure that the day-to-day -day organization of, of and business of, of our organization continues so that, we, so that we are able to do two things at the same time. It's the same thing 
it doesn't necessarily mean for a business. It could be for any government department or any federal department whereby um, you're providing a service and something happens and it disrupts that service provision, but you still have to look at what the fundamentals are of the other services you provide. And there may be a short-term duration where we're not able to provide everything, but there are some key things that you need to identify that need to be or should be continued to provide. So um, that, that's really what business continuity is all about. And we provide uh, that assistance to municipalities through EMO. And I believe the final service that I'm gonna be showing you today is our geospatial modeling services. So um, EMO it has expanded upon its situational awareness services to local authorities, governments and stakeholders to provide effective and efficient information coming from the duty officers for decision-making process. So we are in the process of hiring a, um, a GIS specialist, but we have already created, working with an arrangement with the Government of Canada, uh, created GIS modeling for both flood and fires in 2022. And we're, we're rolling that into 2023 as well as those events unfold. Hopefully they won't, but if they do, we are prepared with our plan. And um, it, it just means so much more to people when they can actually see what it is we're trying to describe, what the, the extent of these uh, emergencies or disasters are in the province of Manitoba. So that's a listing of our services that we do provide. And what I wanna get into next is just uh, outlining again from a geospatial representation where our four regional emergency management boundaries are. So within the province of Manitoba, um, we have uh, four different regions and the regions are known as the Capital and Red River region. That's a region that is very busy during flood season or, or to the early spring in Manitoba in most years. Then we have a uh, central, western and eastern, northern. So we've combined two geographic areas in the province of Manitoba for those four. So this is a, a, a geospatial representation of all of the areas in the province of Manitoba. So the western um, Red River Valley, uh, Eastern, Northern, and Central. So let's go look at these one at a time. So we have these broken down and these maps can be made available uh, to anyone uh, that would like to see them in greater detail, but it lists not only geospatially where these are and in relation to each other, but it also lists alphabetically where these are and what municipalities or local authorities fit within each region. That's very helpful when you're trying to identify where things are. The central region is identified the same way. We have a map broken out that identifies what the names of the municipalities are and uh, alphabetically uh, where they are connected as well or which ones are within this region. The Capital Red River region, as I've identified, is basically uh, from the lake right down to the U.S. border. And um, it, it may not have as many municipalities, but they are very active when it comes to emergency management in the province of Manitoba, and we're very happy to be working with them more closely than some of the other regions to ensure that we're all prepared. And then finally, the eastern and northern region. Um, so that's every region from the Red River Valley over and then right up from the 53rd parallel up to uh, Nunavut border. And uh, we work with those folks and have our regional emergency managers out visit with them on a regular basis. So. We're almost done, folks. I just want to give you uh, a couple, a little, a uh, little bit more information. So, what did 2022 look like for Manitoba Emergency Measures Organization? Well, there were four rather large events that happened. So, like the rest of the world, we assisted with the management of specific aspects of COVID-19, and we were just beginning to wind down two very specific task forces. The first task force was the vac vaccine implementation task force. So, even though it was more of a health response to COVID-19 around the world. Uh, we at, at EMO provided a little bit of additional support related to rolling out the vaccine and in addition, rolling out the testing of, um, of COVID-19 or for COVID-19. Then the spring flood of 2022 was a result not of the amount of snow that we accumulated over the winter of 2021 to 2022, but rather from the five Colorado lows that began in the spring. In addition to those, um, you may not be aware that Manitoba receives all of the overland waters from the Rockies in the west, so the other side of in, in Alberta, um, and northern Ontario's watershed, as well as all of the waters from the northern United States. And they converge just, just a little bit south of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And so that's one of the reasons why we had the Red River Floodway um, 
because we know that those waters are going to come. And so sometimes it's it's a river that's 500 feet across, and sometimes it's it's not a river. It's just a body of water that's moving that can be upwards of 18 miles wide. So um, we we have to ensure that we are prepared for those kind of things. And something else that people may not know is the water in Manitoba, once it once it reaches Manitoba, actually flows from south to north, and it empties into the Hudson's Bay. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our floodway. Uh, in 2022, the Red River floodway operated for the longest time span uh, for a spring operation since it began operation in 1968. So last year was a significant flood event for the province of Manitoba. In addition, there were 600 evacuees from nine municipalities and one provincial park and 2,134 evacuees from seven First Nation communities and the spring flooding triggered 66 authorities or, or municipalities to declare local states of emergency. So that was 45 municipalities and 11 Indigenous Reconciliation Northern Relation communities. And for the first time, one provincial park. So White Shell Provincial Park actually needed to declare a state of local emergency, as well as nine First Nations. That was the spring. And while all of that is winding down and, and we're starting to ensure everything is returning back to normal, the recovery aspect of things, Manitoba saw more than 32 fires burning this summer with a total of 79,000 hectares burnt. So Manitoba worked uh, with all local authorities, emergency management partners, including Manitoba Wildlife, to provide uh, guidance and support for emergency response to activities. And we work closely with Indigenous Services Canada, or ISC as we call it, and the Canadian Red Cross in supporting an ISC-led response uh, measures with First Nation communities. So, so those three things were happening almost simultaneously. And then if that wasn't enough, we're almost at the one year anniversary since the beginning of the war on the Ukraine, which is, uh, which is identified as February 24th. And this is an event that happened on the other side of the globe, but yet it also had an impact in Manitoba. And, and Manitoba continues to lead the country, the country of Canada, in providing a full range of settlement supports and services to Ukrainians fleeing from this brutal war of aggression. On a per capita basis, more Ukrainians have sought refugee in Manitoba than in any other provinces. Based on uh, federal data, roughly 12% of all arrivals are coming to Manitoba. So Manitoba's EMO created a Manitoba Ukrainian Refugee Task Force. And this model of our URTF or task force is a national benchmark. And to date, thanks to the efforts of the URTF or the task force and the overwhelming support of the Ukrainian Canadian community, uh, to Manitobans, over 17,200 Ukrainians have presented to Manitoba's reception and welcoming center. Over 149,000 nights of safe shelter and accommodation have been provided. Approximately 13,200 provincial healthcare cards have been issued, and over 11,700 reimbursement claims for the cost of federal immigration medical examinations have been re required and uh, have been provided for these these folks. And all of this I've just mentioned. So those four things, the COVID, the task force, the flood, the forest fires, the Ukrainian refugee task force are working with an incredible team of just 12 people at Manitoba Emergency Measures Organization. As I said before, we have a number of amazing partners, but in terms of keeping all of this going, keeping the management going, keeping the coordination going of all of these things happening almost simultaneously, there's only 12 people. And I'm very proud to be a part of this organization. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, we have discussed Manitoba ZMO's mandate, its mission, vision, values, its principles, its goals, our priorities, our programs, the services we offer, and a regional breakdown of where everything happens in the province of Manitoba. So with that, and I think I had 35 minutes, so I've got 40 seconds to spare. I'm gonna ask if there are any questions and turn it back over to the IPAC staff. Thank you so much, Robert. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so, so far we have two questions. So I'll just remind everyone that's on the call um, to go ahead and enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, first, there was a question. Um, they're just wondering if they can get a copy of the presentation afterwards. So if that's possible, we can work together and make sure that everyone can get a copy of your presentation. Um, and then uh, the other question here 
is training related. So it says all other provinces and territories have EMOs or similar organization as authority having jurisdiction for instant command systems standard holders. Why is it Manitoba has the Office of the Fire Commission hold that responsibility and not Manitoba EMO? That's an interesting question. And, and to be honest, I don't have the background on that uh, in terms of why why the OFC has it. I do know the history of incident command systems and started out of Operation Wildfire in, in um, sorry, Fire Scope in California back in the 1970s. And so I, I think it always has been fire based that way. Um, that is not to say that Manitoba EMO doesn't offer ICS or incident command system training and education. And we do utilize incident command systems within uh, our responses as well. So um, I would say that um, we, we do, we just don't ha uh, have the same thing because there has been an agreement with the Office of the Fire Commissioner and incident, uh, what is it, ICS Canada. And so, so I would say that's the response. But if you, if you need more detail than that, I, I can definitely dig into that and, uh, and find a response for you. And um, just a reminder, if we don't get through your question or if we need some follow-up, um, I'll just pop our email into the chat here um, as well so that if you wanted to send your um, questions, you can send it to manitoba at ipac.ca and then we can always um, send you some more information later on. Um, so I have another question here. So this one says, thank you, Robert, good information. I've got a couple questions thinking of citizens in Manitoba. The continuous power supply is critical during winter months, no power, no heat, and likely there's no water. So then they have a sort of a series of questions. So maybe we'll go through them one by one. Um, so do you have a response plan uh, collaborating with Manitoba Hydro in case of longer power interruptions? Um, and uh, I guess in terms of, uh, in case of the, of days like today, how well are citizens prepared? For example, most of our buildings, commercial or residential, do not have backup power. So we'll start with that one first. <laughs> yes, an excellent question, well done. Um, so in essence, um, we do have plans and we do work very closely with Manitoba Hydro, both from a power perspective and from a gas perspective, because in the province of Manitoba, we've also had significant outages of both. And so, um, um, it is, and it's very, very dangerous on a day like today where it's, you know, minus 45 outside with the wind chill. And so we want to make sure everyone is safe. And so we have plans not only with those entities, but we also have uh, equipment holders that we could provide large scale, um, you know, resources or pieces of equipment to municipalities uh, in, all, in, in essence as well to ensure that, that things are taken care of and that other services are, are properly taken care of in times of uh, extreme temperatures. Um, we also, um, I would say, try to do as much as we can on the education or the preparedness side to ensure that Manitobans are aware of, of ensuring that they have a plan in the event that there is a power failure or a water failure or a gas failure, and they should know what to do independently. And so uh, we do offer... Um, we do offer education and we do offer um, sessions where we provide the emergency preparedness. And in fact, in the month of May, uh, every year is emergency preparedness month in the province of Manitoba. And we try and offer as much information and share as much information as we can so that individuals can be better prepared uh, for, for events just like that or and, and tied to any kind of emergency. So not necessarily just for, for power loss. Um, there was a similar situation in Texas due to a winter storm back in 2021. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have definitely heard from Texas. We've learned things from them. We've received the information about what happened. It is a little bit different in terms of our power connectivity. And um, there are things that we can do going forward that we're looking at right now, working with municipalities to have um, to have better preparedness. And that involves renewable energies. Now, I can't say a lot about that, but that is one of the alternatives that can provide individuals with more support, ensuring that, that things are, are accessible for them. And, and I'll just say one last thing. We also work, of course, very closely with municipalities. And in many events, we have also ensured that there are heating shelters available to citizens to ensure they're, they're taken care of. So what's really important, I think, in an event like that is ensuring that you have proper networking and connection where people can follow up and then people know what to do within the municipalities, where to go, and, and what services can be offered and be sought uh, so that people are taken care of. 
I hope that answers your questions. There's just uh, one more actually in um, this webinar chat. So um, considering the climate change impact on the ocean level, is there any concerns about the Hudson Bay becoming a barrier to our river's flow? Um, not sure I understand the question, but I'll, but I'll try and answer it. So definitely climate change impacts are a huge aspect of what we do at Emergency Measures Organization, and they're changing constantly. And I will tell you that Manitoba EMO is busier now than we ever have been in our existence since we were first formed. And a result of that is climate change. So we're very aware of these things. We're following the IPAC reports. We're, we're looking at all the information that becomes available to us publicly. Uh, is there any concerns about the Hudson Bay becoming a barrier to our river flow? Again, as I said, the water flows from south to north. And so it's not necessarily a, a barrier because the water flows in the opposite direction. So I, I apologize if I didn't understand your question appropriately, but at this point, it's, it's not a barrier. Thanks for that. Um, I don't actually see any more questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A box. Um, maybe give it a couple more minutes, but um, so just to end it off here, um, I've uh, posted just a little bit of information about IPAC um, for those of you that um, aren't aware of IPAC and um, what we do, feel free to um, visit our website. So ipac.ca slash Manitoba. Um, and I also popped in our email address, like I mentioned earlier, um, manitoba at ipac.ca. Um, so uh, with that, I, I think we can go ahead and end, end the session. Thank you so much once again, Robert. Um, and just a reminder that this was, uh, uh, I guess, the episode or part two of our series, and there will be more to come. So keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Appreciate that. Bye-bye now.